Hi, I'm Ben Guyvers with the Music Partnerships team at Dolby Laboratories based in Los Angeles. And on this month's Music Community Sessions, I am super excited to welcome mix engineer and producer Dave Emery. Dave is the 2023 winner of the MPG Dolby Atmos Mix of the Year Award for his work on Maggie Rogers' Want One. Super excited to talk to Dave here today. I'll also be joined by Dolby's Jordan Glasgow and mix engineer Nick Reeves to share the new features of the Dolby Atmos Renderer 5.1, which includes head tracking for creators. So be sure to drop your questions in the questions box for Nick and Jordan. And super excited, as I said, to welcome Dave Emery as well. Dave's career started alongside the legendary Spike Stent at the world famous Olympic Studios in London, where he worked on albums by the likes of Madonna, Bjork, Coldplay, and he has been busy mixing Dolby Atmos for artists like Ed Sheeran, Foo Fighters, Charlie XCX, No Doubt, and Gwen Stefani, Gorillaz, and more. And Dave's going to join from his Dolby Atmos studio at Battery, Battery Studios in London to talk about his work on some of those and his award-winning mix for Maggie Rogers. Nick Reeves is also a very accomplished Dolby Atmos mix engineer who is with Capital and PMC. He is now with UMG. Uh, he has joined us recently at South by Southwest for our Music Accelerator program. Super excited to have him here as well to talk about the new features in the Dolby Renderer 5.1 along with Jordan. So an all-star cast today. So we'll jump into that in a moment. Be sure to grab a trial download of the Dolby Atmos Renderer 5.1 at professional.dolby.com. That's where you can also grab version one, two of the Dolby Atmos album assembler. Be sure to check out the session uh, that we did on the Dolby Atmos album assembler with Jordan and Andrew and Luke from Georgetown Masters uh, at the Dolby Atmos music community sessions page where they do a deep dive into that and share all the features of the Dolby Atmos album assembler. Uh, also at the pro site are the links for the Dolby Atmos knowledge base, the FAQs and the forums. Uh, those are great resources uh, and the forums are actually interactive resources where you can ask technical questions and get answers from Dolby's experts. People like Adam and Bennett, huge shout out to those folks for the great work that they're doing supporting the community and answering questions on our forums. Uh, you can also grab the free Dolby PHRTF creator app to create your personal customized binaural monitoring profile to use with Dolby Atmos renderer for creating Dolby Atmos music. Uh, you use your smartphone to create your personalized profile, which is uniquely tailored to you. This will improve localization and space in headphones and can actually be a more comfortable way to mix and listen as well as more accurate. So be sure to check that out. Uh, at the pro site, you'll also find links to the Dolby Atmos self-guided training, uh, which has just been updated to include Dolby Atmos renderer version five, and has also been reorganized with different exercise sets for music and for post-production. So a huge shout out to John Scanlon and the Dolby Institute team for all the great work that they're doing there, including the work on their new artist accelerator program. Uh, you can actually go to the page and listen to music made by the artists, producers and mixers involved with that great program which is all about supporting emerging creatives. Okay, in last month's session, we featured a session with mastering engineers Piper Payne from Nito Mastering and Dale Becker from Becker Mastering as part of our ongoing spotlight on mastering engineers working in Dolby Atmos. Be sure to check out that session and all the previous sessions at our Music Community Sessions page and our YouTube channel. And with that, we'll jump into our chat with Dave Emery. That'll be followed by Adobe Atmos Renderer 5.1 with Jordan and Nick Reeves. Be sure to add your questions here. All right, I'm thrilled to be joined by my guest today from Battery Studios in London, producer and mix engineer Dave Emery. Thanks for joining us, Dave. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing, Ben? Doing well, thank you so much. So again, really appreciate you being here and we are excited to hear about the great work you've done on your MPG award-winning Dolby Atmos Mix of the Year for Maggie Rogers one one. So a huge congrats on that. And thank excited you. to hear about some of the other Atmos mix work that you've done. But um, maybe you could start by sharing a little bit about your background in music. Um, your career started at the legendary Olympic Studios, right? With the also legendary uh, Spike Stent. I mean, that must have been like an amazing way to break in and begin. What were the early days of your career like uh, coming into the industry? Um, they were good. I just, I was in and out of bands and always wanted to be in, in studios working. And I just started doing work experience and just got really lucky. At the time I was doing work experience, Spike's assistants were leaving and then he was looking for new ones and just offered me the position. Um, 
So it was back in the days when you, you know, it was all on the board and all gear. So it was all the recall sheets and we were still printing to that and half inch. Um, and it was pretty full on. It was, there was two of us assisting him. Um, and I learned a lot, a lot, a lot from him. Um, and then I had the other chance of going into the other rooms as well to record. So after a few years to go in engineer and that was quite a, an eye opener as well. So big orchestras and bands and stuff. It was really, it was definitely a good grounding. Yeah, I'm sure. And, you know, with Spike, you worked on some massive records, right? By some of the world's biggest artists, Madonna, Bjork, Coldplay. Uh, that, those must have been amazing experiences. Yeah. I mean, the guy's a, a magician. I mean, he's the best of the best. And it was just, just an honor to be doing that small part in the background, just made sure the running, the ship ran smoothly. Nice. And so from there, you uh, started working for Stuart Price, right? Yeah, I stayed at Olympic for a while. Um, I was there till about 2009, 10, round about then. Um, and we'd done, I'd met Stuart working for Spike when we did the Madonna album. Stuart produced it and wrote a lot of it. Um, we met there and then he went, went away, stayed with Spike. And then when it came to leave, I was engineering with Stuart on the Killers album. And then he was like, do you want to come and work for me solely? Because at that point, Spike had moved to LA and it was sort of just the right transition. Um, I really wanted to learn the production and on the production side, he's, he's, he's a G. His, his synth skills were great. And so we went for a couple of years and I just engineered for him and just observed. Nice. That's how it's done, right? Well, you, you had some great teachers there. So what was your introduction to Dolby Atmos and uh, how did you start mixing music in Atmos? Um, I used to do a lot of the 5.1 mixing. Um, so I did like No Doubts and we do the MTV World Stage and Fun and all bands like that. So I was Surround Sound was definitely an interest to me. Um, Five One sort of died a death and the works sort of stayed up and I stayed in the stereo. And then like a few years back, I, I, you'd heard about it and it was always this, what is it like? What is it? I remember a long time ago, someone had sent me, not not, even, not in the music industry, sent me, on WhatsApp, this audio thing and said, how does this work? And it was just, it was like, if I remember rightly, it was like a dance track and things were going round its head. And, and like, I didn't even know at the time, this would have been like a long, long time ago. And I just replied to him, was like, I guess they've done it with like delays and everything. And it just spurred me on to find out what it was. And that led me to Dolby. Um, and then after a load of thinking about it and learning about it, I just got the system and just learned the hard way. Took a load of the sessions and stuff that I'd mixed in stereo and experimented with it and learned what to do. Um, and then, as always, Spike is very supportive of me and a great friend. Helped me into it um, and I showed him what I could do. Um, and he just started using me to do a lot of his, his stereo stuff. He'd send all of his work my way and it was great. And that just sort of as you can imagine, it was a good stepping stone of incredible artists to be working with. And it opened a lot of doors. Uh, as I, yet again, in my career, I had to owe Spike a lot. You're sat in your room at, at Battery Studios now, right? Um, what gear did you choose and, and what's the layout of the room? So I went with the Genelec system um, and I put them around. I used them because they were, you, you can adjust the levels quite well to the room. And I thought that was the best way to go. Um, so I set it up, um, I spoke to Dolby, they came down, collaborated the room, um, and it sounded good. I think I just got quite fortunate in this room. It's a very good sounding room that I'd always do the stereo work in. Um, so I was extremely fortunate in that. Um, I use the, I've got Avid interfaces that it comes out of. Um, I use the, um, uh, GML to control it with the Genelec, another reason why I went with them. Um, and it's pretty pretty simple other than that. I uh, have a PreSonus MIDI controller to control the solos inside. Um, and then just went with it. I, use, I have a mixture of the headphones to check it on. I do use the, um, I don't know the model, but the, you know, the Apple ones. But I also went and got the Beats as well and just try and vary it up. Um, got a Sonos system at home that I try and reference mixes on. It's quite difficult to check your mixes on. Nice. Well, it's great having the GLM um, tuning and room calibration sort of all in one there for your room. That's that's very helpful and uh, 
Nice, man. So um, let's talk a little bit about your mixing process, um, what you're receiving and kind of how you're laying out your sessions. Um, of course, when you're doing both the stereo and Atmos mixes, you have the, those assets from the beginning. But um, if you're doing just the Atmos mix, what is it that you're receiving from the stereo mix engineer or the producer and kind of getting into the process? So generally, you try and get it, you want the stem spit out as much as you can. Um, so you get the mastered um, WAV. I get the stems and I try and match them as much as I can. For me, I would always put, just to help things out, I try and get the muck, the master, the start of the master file at one hour, just to make things pretty so easy for when you're exporting it out, because you have to export the time code out. So it's just for a brief one, just putting the zero one at the front, keeps it nice and easy. Um, and then I'll just lay it out the same way I will very much, it's very much like I would a stereo mix. So for me, I have the drums at the top, then bass guitars, keys down below, lead vocal and BVs all below it. Um, and I would start the same way I would with a stereo mix. I'll start with the drums. Um, I, I matched a, a stereo first at the front. So everything coming out left and right front, make sure everything's there. I matched a mastered WAV. I would find it, bring it down to the minus 18 luffs, match my um, stems to that. So I'd group them all, bring them down. So I'm roughly in that ballpark and then start to mix. Um, and then it's relative to what it is. I mean, you, you are at the mercy of the mix engineer, the stereo mix engineer of what the stems they've done. Generally speaking, they're really good these days and split out as much as you can. I, I like to have the kick and snare separate because I find in the mix that's what gets lost a lot. So I like to have control over those. Um, and then it's just moving things around and it's all relative. I, I tend to keep the base of the drums towards the front of the mix. Um, so you've got the weight there, so the kick and the snare and everything's at the front. Percussive stuff you can bring into the room slightly. Um, bass, it all depends on the type of bass it is. A lot of the time I'm, I'd leave it at the front of the room or bring it in, but not too far in, as it can get quite woolly and too much, too overpowering. Um, and then everything just fits in. So it depends on what the part's playing. If it's got a guitar heavy track, I'd keep them towards the, the front, but front middle, as that's the base of it. And then everything sort of back and all effects, then I would use the Dolby Panner a lot things like that to keep it moving to keep it interesting and um, vocal wise generally speaking my lead vocals at the front of the room um, and then it will come in it, it will never be more than i'd say a quarter of the way in as i find it goes a bit funky on um headphones uh, and then bvs again depending on what they're doing all around me i, I guess there's no like set way. I, I treat it very much like a stereo. I take it as each one comes. Um, and it's just about finding the uh, feel in the room. I'll always start the mix in the room. I'll get it up heavily in the room. So it's feeling rocking in the room. Then when I'm happy with it, I'm thinking, okay, this is exciting. And the drums are still punching. I would um, run it down, check my levels. Get roughly back into the the ballpark of the minus 18 and then move on to headphones check on headphones there's a lot of things that then do need to change generally speaking you find that the vocal is too quiet and needs to come up um, and the drums might not be as punchy i would still treat it a lot like a stereo so i'll have a lot of like buses to compressors going and, and, and things like that all internally just to keep that punch and drive going um, and then when i'm having the headphones come out rebalance again in the room be aware of things like if the vocal feels a bit louder then i wouldn't turn it down because i'd know on the headphones and then that's finishing it off between the room and the headphones yeah nice and just to uh, drill in just a little bit further on that are do you find that like keeping the kick the drums the sub in the in the bed channels tends to give it the most kind of kick and pump and is most effective and then use the panner and the height channels for like background vocals and, and objects. Yeah, I, I find you got more control of it, of the bed, because the same way you would approach it in a stereo mix. Um, but again, it does depend, but generally I wouldn't be putting any kick or snare 
anywhere other than the weight of the room. Snares, I mean, it, it, maybe with a snare, I would bring that yeah, that into the room. Kick and you have to be you have to be careful. I find L live live drums especially careful because when you move into the headphones, I find they can become a bit washy and a bit top end, like that harshness that you have to be aware of. And I guess that's just the delays that are added. And you talked a little bit about um, your low frequencies, but what are you finding works best for sending information to your LFE channel? Bass and kick, um, and any low synths that need to go, will go. Generally, that's, that's about it. And then you mentioned the translation to headphones, which of course is a, an important step. Uh, are you using the uh, binaural metadata settings plugin? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and they will change again relative to the mix. I, I try not to um, be set in my way. I, I try to keep things as simple as I can. And if it needs to change, I'll change it. So generally I'll start with um, front, middle and far. And then depending on what needs to be, I might put things on. Um, things might be turned off. Things might be set to far. Then just becomes I don't have a I don't have a template I find I get a bit um stagnant when I do that I, I like to keep it up and treat every mix different I guess yeah it's about what the song calls for right and making those decisions uh to best treat the song um and you talked a little bit about um your sono system for QCing are you exporting mp4s to send to clients uh, of course you're using those probably to play back through your sono system um is that typically how you send your clients a, a file for qc or do they you actually send them adms to listen to back in the renderer it just depends um i'm finding generally i send the bins um for a headphone check um some clients prefer the mp4 um and the, the major labels want the adms to check as well it's all just dependent on what they want. But I, I tend to send the bin would be my first point of call to send and then the MP4 and obviously the ADM if they've got the system to play back. If not, I tend to uh, ask them to come in and have a listen on the system here if they're in London. So let's talk a bit about your uh, MPG Dolby Atmos Mix of the Year Award. Congratulations again on that um, for for Maggie Rogers. Want, want, um, Wow, what a cool song. I mean, it's really about her main vocal in a lot of ways, right? It's very focused in in some senses. Uh, and then it goes wide with the harmonies and the layers kind of really giving it a, a push. You've got the screams going on and um, they seem to have movement and the chorus like hits super hard and the guitars and synths are, are, are wide. How did you uh, approach that mix and what a great job you did? Um, well, first off, you have to say that one was mixed by Spike. So half the job's done for me in the, in the first thing. I mean, he had the mix banging. Uh, and my job was just to not lose the excitement and punch that Spike had put into that stereo. Because that's always my fear is that we lose that. Um, and then it was just about having fun. Once once you get the drums sorted and the bass and that's feeling rocking here in the system, then it was just moving things around. And there was so much in that track um, that you could have fun with. And you, I used a lot of the patter. And, and a lot of the time I would manually um, uh, automate things in just to keep it rather than keeping it all synced. I would grab it and move it where I needed to go and just experiment until it was feeling good. Absolutely. And a shout out to Spike. Another um, mix that Spike did in stereo is the Portugal the Man record, right? Which you mixed in Atmos. Um, uh, also amazing treatment of vocals there. How was uh, your process doing that record? Pretty much the same. Um, I, I think from what I can remember, a lot of the time, uh, I've kept the vocal, the, the lead vocals at the front and then any others around you and it moves. Generally, I'd have some BVs sit in the back just here. So just past the middle point, slightly up. Um, but yeah, it was a lot, of, a lot of fun. It's a good album. So yeah, it was, it was nice. And I, I try to keep, the, again, just everything that's put in there, the excitement and warmth and everything else that's there. Um, it's just as I do, I just 
player player by ears. Use the bun in there. Yeah, and you've got got that good ear. Um, you're also mixing a lot of UK hip hop, Stormzy, um, Potter Paper. How's your process for for those records? Again, just it's the same. It depends. Some of the um, hip hop stuff there actually can be quite little to play with because they might have just used a sample. So you've, it's a serious sample with vocals. Um, and then it then it becomes a little bit trickier. Generally, the, the, the drums are separate. So you just try and get the punch of the drums still there. Um, and if it is just a sample, I'll bring it into the room slightly and then just get the creative with the vocals and any effects that you could try and cut out and move those, place those in the room that gives it the feel that of, of the atmosphere. And it can be a little bit tricky, but I mean, I love it. I love the music. And it's just, again, just make sure it's banging. <laughs> yeah, I love those too. Well done. Um, and then you've also done some some back catalog work, which must be an interesting process going through catalogs of artists like Ed Sheeran and No Doubt and Gwen Stefani. Uh, what's the process like working through uh, an entire back catalog in Atmos? Um, well, it's interesting because the Gwen Stefani one, I would have been the assistant engineer on it who printed the stems. <laughs> so it's quite, it's like one big circle to come back on me. Um, it's good, obviously, with um, back catalog, the with the Ed Sheeran stuff, that's all good because it was stealth. The first album, there was um, a couple of ones where we'd had to work off the multi tracks, original multi tracks. But from the second album onwards, it was fine because all the stems were there. With um, generally speaking, I don't um, love back catalogue because I find you're quite limited by the way it has been stemmed. We, we didn't stem the way we would now. So they're quite basic stems. You get drums, bass, guitars. And so to, to get the um, to get the fun part out, it can be quite tricky. I find I end up cutting a lot out and moving it, but it, it's good and I enjoy it. Um, a lot of file recovery, let's say, on certain things. A lot of people scratching their heads are where files can be. Yeah. Well, it's great to kind of breathe new life into back catalog work and give it a, um, a new way to be experienced. And I know a lot of people are excited about, about those. So. What's next for you, Dave? Anything exciting coming up that you can share with us or that you'd like to point out? Um, I, I've, um, I've got a, a few albums coming out. A lot of, I probably can't say, so I don't want to tempt fate. There's a few things, a few albums coming around. Uh, we've got Mahalia's album coming out, I think, this Friday. Um, Anne-Marie is out in a few weeks, I think. Um, and there's a few more in the pipeline that are coming in. I can't really dwell on more. But yeah, some exciting projects, let's say. I'm sure the labels will appreciate that. I just, uh, I'm always curious. So uh, <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Dave, thank you so much for your time. And if folks have questions, they can drop them into the questions tab here and go to, and we'll answer those shortly. Okay, thank great. you. Thanks. All right, very happy to be joined once again by Dolby's Jordan Glasgow. And for the first time on the community sessions, uh, although we've done many events together out in the world and virtually over the past few years, including at South by Southwest pretty recently, very pleased to welcome mix engineer Nick Reeves. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Uh, would love if you could each share a little bit uh, about yourselves and what you do, and uh, then we'll get into the Dolby Atmos Renderer 5.1 with the new features and improvements, uh, including support for head tracking. So, Nick, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and uh, a little bit about what you do, please. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Nick Reeves. I'm based out of Los Angeles, California. I'm the director of audio engineering for Universal Music Group. And a big part of that role is mixing and working in the immersive space. So I've been mixing Dolby Atmos as part of that team and at Capitol Studios for what was since about 2017. So, you know, got in early and I've had the privilege of working closely with Dolby and the team, uh, helping develop the tools, provide feedback and, you know, just work towards understanding how we can make this the best experience we can. Awesome. And chances are, if people have heard Adobe Atmos Mix out in the world, they, they probably heard your work. So uh, thank you again for being here and for everything that you've done. Okay, Jordan, 
folks know you, but if you would just give a quick introduction and remind them uh, about the amazing work that you do. Yeah, I'm Jordan Glasgow. I lead product management here at Dolby for some of our Dolby Atmos content creation and distribution tools like the renderer and the album assembler. Awesome. So Jordan, head tracking in the renderer, it's a longstanding feature request, right? From, from many Atmos content creators and it really gives them the ability to interact with the room while they're mixing on headphones. So do you wanna jump in and walk through a, a quick demo of head tracking and the new features of the Dolby Atmos renderer 5.1? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Dolby Atmos renderer 5.1 that we're seeing here and uh, head tracking is the main new feature. Um, the device that we are compatible with at launch is the Supperware Head Tracker 1, and you can purchase this on the Supperware website. It's 65 pounds plus shipping. They're in the UK, obviously. And essentially, it's a USB device that straps onto the top of your headphones like this. Maybe you can see it. There it is. And it connects to the renderer via OSC, or Open Sound Control. So there's a couple things that you need to do to set this up. In the renderer's preferences, you can enable head tracking here and select the OSC head tracker. We also have the ability to connect to a driver. So if there's other partners in the future who wanna make head tracking devices and write their own driver, you might see that pop up in that list in the future. Once head tracking is enabled, you can install or launch the Bridgehead application that ships with Supperware. You can download, download this for free from their site. And this allows you to set up a couple of things in preferences and also see the moving head as you're seeing here. You're also noticing that there's now a head view in the renderer's room view. And you can turn that on here in the view uh, drop down menu. And the other thing to note is once connected, it says head tracking, OSC head tracker down at the bottom here. And that's pretty much it. Uh, once that's all configured, you can go ahead and hit play. And hopefully you guys will hear this as well. And turn your head and you hear the sound tracking with the movements of your head. So why did we do this? Um, the, whole, the whole reason for doing this is to help you the mixer and creative get more immersed in your mix while mixing binaurally, especially if you're sitting in a room with speakers and you want to switch over to headphones. This kind of helps you feel like you're still in that room with speakers rather than being locked in your headphones. Um, so the whole idea is to help you get more inside of the mix, help you get a better binaural mix faster. Um, but you guys shouldn't take it from me because I'm not a real mixer. That's why we have Nick here. So. Nick, would love to hear uh, your experience using head tracking so far with, with the Supperware device. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think it's just a really nice addition to the feature set that allows us to best engage with the work that we're doing, no matter where we are. You know, so sometimes, you know, we don't always have the luxury of being in these big studios with big monitoring systems, uh, but we need to get the work done or we need to get mixes off the ground. And so... You know, it's so great that we can continue to work in Atmos with the, you know, limited resources like simply a laptop. And so working in binaural, of course, is great. And the more time spent in that space, the better we can understand, you know, the user's headphone experience. And I think adding head tracking to that tool set is a really great and valuable step forward. Uh, not only does it give us an opportunity to, you know, reassess sort of the energy and the way it's distributed around the virtual room space, you know, in the Atmos renderer. But it also gets us a, a more tactile opportunity to explore what a lot of our users are experiencing. You know, we know one of the major uh, out, outlets for Atmos consumption in headphones is on the Apple platform, and they have a very good implementation of head tracking. So it brings us one step closer to anticipating the user experience uh, for the way our, you know, our fans are going to hear it. And also for us to evaluate more critically the way we're distributing energy and information around the space so that when we do get in a room to hear it on speakers that we can, you know, really understand what it is that we've created and just, you know, get that much more control over what it is that we're, we're making and, and how people are going to be listening to it. So, so I think it's a nice uh, opportunity to expand the tool set and just give us more flexibility uh, and more opportunity to benefit from the headphone experience. Great. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, you know, you brought up Apple. Um, so one thing to note here is that, you know, when you're head tracking while mixing, the 
there's nothing written into the ADM file. There's no metadata that's being transferred to the encoding process that the end user will hear. This is kind of single-ended, so to speak, in that everything you do here is just for you, the mixer. If the person listening on the other end chooses to enable head tracking, that's cool. They'll get a very similar experience, but if they don't, that's fine too. Um, any thoughts, Nick, about how, how those two things kind of translate or work together, like whether the, the mixer is using head tracking, whether the consumer is doing it, does it matter? You know, I think it's all about the opportunity to choose our own adventure. You know, speaking personally, when I listen to Dolby Atmos content on like a mobile device, I don't use head tracking because I want to experience the sort of fixed musical field that's been curated by the mixer. Um, especially if I'm consuming the media without video as, as a component in that experience. Uh, but that's my personal choice. And I know a lot of people really enjoy what head tracking brings to the headphone experience, especially when it comes to the externalization that happens with Atmos content. Um, so, you know, I think as far as adding that tool to our creative tool belt, it just helps better understand what that experience is going to be like for listeners. And also, you know, like I was saying, you know, especially, you know, the first time I got to explore head tracking with, uh, with the Dolby renderer, it was in a very prototype stage during the pandemic where I couldn't get into studios with big monitoring systems. So it enabled me to have a better access to what I was creating by being able to shift my perspective in the same way that I do when I'm sitting in a room with the speakers in fixed locations, right? You know, a big part of what's so fun about the immersive experience is that that dynamic of different things happening in different places. And I think for people who really enjoy that experience in speakers and sometimes struggle with what uh, happens in the headphone space, Head tracking can be a very useful opportunity to explore what decisions are being made creatively and how to interact with that three-dimensional space. So, you know, being able to have access to that while creating just gives us that much more opportunity to understand the experience we're creating for our listeners. Whether we use head tracking or not, I think it's a great way to, you know, just bridge that gap between the consumer experience and the professional experience. Cool. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that's pretty much it for head tracking. We hope you will check it out. Go to the Supperware website and uh, order yours today. And, you know, the other features in Render 5.1, there's a few small things that um, you might find useful here. The renderer now retains your binaural settings uh, rather than, um, you know, going back to the default after each launch. So that's cool. If you do want to get back to the default, you can just hit the default button. There's also a new keyboard shortcut for clearing all of your clips in the meters, and that is option C. There's a couple of bug fixes and other things that you can check out in the release notes, but head tracking is really the main new feature. So back over to you, Ben. Awesome. Well, thank you both. That was that was great. Um, so if viewers have questions about the Dolby Atmos Render 5.1, any of its new features, including head tracking or, or anything else actually Dolby Atmos related, mixed questions, best practices uh, about mixing in general, um, perhaps the Dolby Atmos album assembler, go ahead and add them to the questions window here uh, for Jordan and Nick, who will both stay on uh, to answer questions now. So with that, let's jump into Q&A. Thanks, guys. All right. I'd like to invite back Nick and Jordan to answer your questions. Again, please drop those into the questions box and go to. And on the screen now is a QR code to get your 90 day trial license for the Dolby Atmos render version 5.1. So zap that, that'll take you to a page where you can also grab a trial of the album assembler and the other content creation and delivery tools. All right, so thank you both for all that amazing information. Jordan, I'm gonna start off with you, a couple of questions related to uh, head tracking in uh, the render of 5.1, um, starting with, Maybe you could explain a little bit about the difference between head tracking and Dolby Atmos personalized rendering, also called PHRTF. Absolutely. So head tracking, as we just showed, is the ability to interact with the binaural mix and move your head around the room and have the sound track with the motion of your head. PHRTF, which you can get, you know, by scanning your head with a mobile app and taking a measurement of your, your head and ears uh, is, you know, everybody has a unique PHRTF based on the way that our, our head and our ears and our shoulders are shaped. And when you're mixing without your personalized 
you know, PHRTF file, you're using the default head, um, which may be similar or not so similar to your own. So using your own PHRTF allows you to tailor the mix specifically um, to your own head. And these are complementary technologies. So you, you can, and we would recommend that you do use them together um, while you're mixing binaurally. Great, thanks. And uh, we started the session off with a link to the PHRTF Creator beta app, so folks can grab that. And they can also go to professional.dolby.com to grab that as well. Okay, a follow-up uh, on the uh, compatible head tracking devices with the renderer. You talked about it a little bit at the beginning, Jordan, but if you could just maybe state again uh, which devices are compatible, please. Yeah, at launch now, the supperware uh Head Tracker One is compatible, and you know we expect more devices to be coming to market in the future. Great, thank you. Um, thanks to everybody that submitted questions ahead of time, and all of those that are that are coming in now. Um, a lot of great questions coming in. Um, Jordan, I'm going to give you one more, and it's about compatibility with Ableton Live, which of course you can do with the Dolby Atmos renderer and the. Um, uh, Music Panner. So the question is, does Ableton Live support Dolby Atmos and what type of CPU load could we expect? Yeah, so you just said it. It works with the Dolby Atmos Music Panner and the Dolby Atmos Renderer. So the Music Panner is a plugin for AU and VST. You can use those in Ableton. Um, they support Mac only. Um, I don't know about CPU load, um, so we can we can follow up on that after the call. Cool. I also want to say that um, professional.dolby.com has a great quick start video that Bennett uh, authored that folks can check out how to quickly get up and running uh, there as well. All right, Nick, over to you. A couple of uh, creation and, and mixing questions. Um, Alex submitted a question. Has mixing in Atmos influenced the way you mix a song in stereo? And uh, conversely, are there any Atmos mixes that have inspired your Atmos mixes? Uh, so yes, definitely. Um, I think for me, I, like a lot of us kind of went straight from stereo to Atmos. So I didn't have any sort of intermediate multi-channel five, one or seven, one mixing outside of like film score stuff, which is so specific to a certain application that I discard that. But so I would say, yes, definitely. I think my mixes got more dynamic. I think there's more intention to the way I think about where I place things in the stereo field because there has to be so much intention in an Atmos production in how we create the landscape that we're listening to. You know, why would you put a certain instrument in a certain location now that there are so many more options and dimensions available to us? We really need to be, you know, conscientious of why we make those decisions and sort of is rather than have it just be arbitrary. So even though stereo can sometimes feel much more limiting by comparison, sometimes when I go back to stereo from Atmos, you know, I've been doing Atmos for a couple of weeks and I go back to stereo, all of a sudden it's like, oh man, I have so many less opportunities to express myself. But at the same time, that codependency becomes such more of a critical relationship. So I try to just think more critically about why I make the decisions I make. I definitely allow my thing, my mixes to be a little bit more dynamic, to breathe a little bit more. And also I rely a lot less on bus based processing because I'm such an object based Atmos mixer and I've spent so much time now working without a mix bus. That has started to affect the way I, I approach the work in stereo as well, rather than sort of relying on what's happening at the, at the, at the bus path. Um, I'm really focused a lot more on automation and individual processing elements and parallels and things like that. You know, all of which have kind of led to a place where my mixes are not not only a little bit more dynamic than they were before I was working in Amos, but also I think with a little bit more attention paid to individual voices rather than like the entire mix uh, for the longest period of time until I get to the very end, in which case then I'm you know, then I'm looking at the forest and not the trees. But uh, but yeah, those are I think some of the ways in which uh, the work has inspired each other. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. And question, another question for you, Nick, coming out of the software side and moving over to the hardware a little bit, do you have a preferred uh, control surface or even a joystick that you like to use uh, with the Dolby Atmos panners? Uh, you know, uh, there are definitely some great and fun tools out there. Uh, I circumstantially I've always kind of been in this position where I'm in different rooms all of the time. So I try not to become too personally dependent on any one piece of gear. 
Um, however, uh, I do quite enjoy a lot of the Avid surfaces because of how high resolution their, their um, opportunities are. So, you know, I'm sitting in front of this S6. I do have the Joy-Con panel in the middle there, which is fun. I desperately wish they were motorized, but um, other than that, it is definitely a lot of fun to work, especially, at, you know, I'm a big fan of tempo synced automation movement. So a lot of that I end up programming with a mouse. But when it comes to more, you know, uh, melodic based automations, like it's a solo or a, or a, or a one-off, you know, ad lib or something like that, then I, I, I do like to use the joysticks if they're sitting in front of me. Otherwise I do like the iPad so that I can just kind of get a continuous access to use my finger as long as it's set up in a hard connection so there's no latency. Um, that's always a fun one. But at the end of the day, you know, you do whatever you can to make it work. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm a trackball guy too. So I'll, I will trackball it up if I have to. <laughs> right on. Thanks. Okay, Jordan, over to you for a couple of render specific questions. Uh, starting off with the question about connecting to a remote computer. Um, is it possible, uh, Amal asks, is it possible to connect the renderer from a remote computer? And if yes, what is the best way to handle 128 channels of audio from the remote computer to the renderer? Yeah, you can have the renderer on a separate computer from your DAW. Uh, people typically route audio via Maddy or Dante. Um, we also do have the Render Remote app, so you can actually view the renderer's UI from, from your DAW computer with the renderer running on a separate computer. Uh, there's a lot more information on that in the um, user's guide for the renderer that you can check out. Great, thanks. Um, renderer question from McKay Gardner. What's up, McKay? Good to see you. Um, he is wondering if the new renderer automatically adds a bed to an ADM file if not present, like the album assembler, and if that's part of the Dolby file format deliverable intention. No, no changes there in the renderer. That's that's not our intention. There's some some things about the way the album assembler works um, and and why it does that. That's something that we're actually considering changing in the album assembler in the future, um, if we can. Thanks. Okay, Nick, over to you. You talked about this a little bit. You prefer to kind of mix in objects, but a theoretical question, objects versus beds from Mark. Uh, what's your preference and what informs those decisions? I mean, I'm a prime time object user myself. Um, I think it gives us the greatest opportunity to engage with the most diverse landscape of playback environments. You know, I mean, the real technological advantage of, of Atmos is the, the rendering, re-rendering opportunities, you know, and I have the privilege of sitting in rooms like this is an 1116, uh, you know, full-size suite with full range speakers everywhere. It's it's a really great environment to mix in. But of course, the second that file leaves the room, I, I got to be able to anticipate headphones and, you know, Sonos and cars and movie theaters and all of these other, you know, great different opportunities. And I have found that mixing with objects gives us a really meaningful opportunity to uh, address all of those needs. You know, I, I can worry less about that diversity of ecosystem uh, when I'm working in objects. And then in particular, because I get the control over the binaural metadata, um, if I'm splitting out, you know, multi-track instruments and stems into separate objects, then I can get the finest granularity of what the experience is like in headphones um, for, you know, ecosystems that, you know, adhere to the, the binaural metadata presentation. And so, you know, I, headphones are just such an important environment that I need to make sure that these mixes sound great in both. And, and object mixing gives us that opportunity. Um, especially, you know, the, the I'm working Pro Tools all the time. And, you know, the very latest version of it accommodates 9.1.6 mix buses, which is really great. But before that, the 712 was just way too limiting as far as the access to the space, especially the idea that I could have front to rear overhead resolution, um, getting into things like the front wides, um, all of those opportunities, those were all object only for the longest time. So even though we now have ecosystems that are a little bit more expanded from a 712 presentation, I just developed my workflow through an object only mixing process. I have an object bed that I can use to return my multi-channel effects. So if you're using those great, you know, like uh, liquid sonics reverbs and stuff that can come back into a 916 environment. I have an object bed to accommodate that, get, get to me around the 712 bed limitation. So, um, you know, I think objects just give us more access and are more fun and more dynamic in the sense that like it, 
really leans into what's so much so much fun about mixing in this for this experience. So so I I generally am an all object all the time kind of guy. I do use the bed for LFE because obviously that's that's the only place you can get to it. I'm pretty sparing with LFE in the sense that because it's a full range protocol, I like to use it for, you know, real like kicks and bases and sub bases, things that like really benefit from a little extra bottom. So many consumer systems are going to use the, you know, subwoofer for base management anyway, that you're, you know, you're going to get access to those resources no matter what, because that's the up to the engineers designing the consumer system. But as far as raw LFE output, which I do filter myself, um, I just use for, you know, really extending things that matter the most, you know, so. So other than that, it's all objects all the time. So when you look at my mixes in the renderer, it's going to be just, you know, dot four on the uh, on the bed and then a bunch of objects. Great, thanks. Another one for you. You've had a couple of questions about use of the center channel, and uh, maybe you can provide some insight sure. on the best practices for for using that channel. Um, I one of the questions, and thank you, Kevin, for asking them. Was you know, is there a difference between how major labels use it and and independent labels? I don't know that to specifically be true. I think it's probably a, a what calls for you know the song, um, the treatment that the song calls for. But maybe you can talk a bit about your you know theory around use of the center channel? Of course, the center channel is a funny one because there's no right or wrong answer, really. Um, you know, for a lot of us, I made the mention that I went jump straight from stereo to to Atmos, or, you know, and so so gaining the center channel for a lot of like pop productions, this is this was kind of that that opening um, sort of experience for me. And, you know, center channel makes perfect sense when there's picture. And when we get into the music only listening experience, a, a lot, myself, a lot of my colleagues, and a lot of the artists I was working with, especially early on, just felt more comfortable with, with, with you know, major front stage information coming from a phantom center presentation. And maybe that's just because that's what we're used to. You know, maybe that's because um, it's a bigger stage and a bigger, you know, presentation, which I think is great. Um, and also, so much of our work is done from stereo stems because we're mixing from mixes that were composed, arranged, produced, mixed, and and presented in stereo, and then we're given stereo stems to then present it in in Atmos. Uh, a lot of times, when there's a lot of like interesting and intense stereo information in those stems, and then they end up remaining as intact as as possible when presented in the in the LR instead of in the center. Um, there, there is no, like, I'm not going to say that there's one way that's better than the other, you know, the, it manifests itself in different ways in different playback systems. I think especially automotive, that's a really interesting challenge, you know, the center channel, you know, because you're not sitting in the middle when you're in a car. And so much of us use that environment for really critical listening. Um, I think that's a, definitely a place where, um, you start to notice some differences in, in the way that presentation works. Um, if you're mixing from multi-tracks with raw mono elements, I'll, I, sometimes I'll be a little bit more inclined to use the center channel. Uh, definitely if it's something live or something where there is picture, I'm way more likely to use the center channel. But in my general meant for music record production Atmos mixes, me personally, especially mixing from stereo stems, prefer to use the LR. But, you know, as, as far as label management goes, that are there, I mean, it's, I don't know anybody who's saying specifically you need to or not need to use the center channel. Channel. Uh, UMG, you know, we, we release a best practices document that helps people understand how to at least explore this discipline without any other opportunities to. And there is some discussion in there about using the center channel, but we definitely don't mandate, reject, or promote any particular mixed practice. It is a creative function and therefore it should be what you want it to be. You know, so if you're a ride or die center channel vocal person, then for sure, go for it. You know, um, I think with some elements, there's a little bit more just bass and kicks and stuff. You get twice as many speakers and real estate and headroom and low frequency production. I think Phantom Center is a little bit more justifiably correct for that. But again, correct is bullshit. It's art. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, but but when it comes to centers or leads or ad libs or backgrounds or, ad, you know, whatever it is, find whatever feels best for you and the artist you're working with. And that's the right answer, you know. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully that also answers uh, Pratish's questions about what you're being delivered and whether you're mixing from STEM. So uh, if not, Pratish, go ahead and, and follow up with us. Um, Jordan, over to you for a couple of questions. Um, Gregory Ives, I believe his question is uh, asking about the new binaural presets in the renderer. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on that, please? 
Yeah, the presets are specifically in the binaural settings plugin, and you know the plugin defaults to all mid um, as the renderer does. We added a couple of presets just to give people a quick way of getting started with um, some alternate configurations. Um, they're there for you to use and check out if you want to use them, um, but of course you're free to make whatever kind of binaural settings you want. And you know, obviously it's an AX plugin, so you can save your own presets as well tailored to you. Great, thanks. Um, I suppose for, for either of you, um, Shane's asking, I've yet to catch much detail on the re-renders and how to ensure re-renders are exported correctly when preparing for distribution. Um, any insight or best practices on re-rendering? Go for it, Nick. Uh, so yeah, channel-based re-renders, like whatever, seven ones or, or five ones or whatever, um, usually don't need to deliver those for music-based production. Often it's a deliverable for, you know, film and TV production. As far as ensuring they behave as best you want them to, uh, direct render in the trim and down mix settings is critically important, especially if you're an object-based mixer. And I did, I think I answered that question in one of these uh, question windows, um, that direct render, you know, it, it, we have to remind ourselves as music producers that you know the RMU was initially designed for television and film-based production, and which is awesome and great. But there are occasionally some hangovers from that presentation that don't necessarily align with the music-based ecosystems. And one of those is that the trim and down mix functions default to low row with trims, and so that's going to change. You know, especially when you get into five one or lower re-renders, that there are going to be you know some pretty concrete decisions made about where those objects end up coming out, and then whether or not they get turned down or not. Well, you know, if you're creating one immersive image of a, you know, like a live orchestra for a film or something like that, that that's really great and helpful. But when you're doing like a pop based production where like maybe you have, you know, drums in the front and like a cool synth pad in the back, you there's no scenario where you want that synth pad turned down 3 dB just because it's coming out of less, you know, speakers than it was in your studio. So so for me and and especially as we get into that conversation about translation to other environments, I think it's an absolute I would say must but I know it's art, so I'm gonna put that asterisk there, that for music-based productions that we use direct render and then you adjust the trim levels for yourself. I do no trims at all. I do direct render of zero trim uh, because I want you know that synth to be maintained as accurately as possible against that drums in the front or whatever I may have chosen to do. And then also when you add your objects in the sides and above, I want them to be, basically, I want the renderer to do everything it can to not adjust the levels and positioning, even if the resources that it's coming out of are limited, like 5.1 compared to 9.1.6. And so, therefore, direct render is a huge advantage to ensuring that that translation works the best. And especially when we think about all these really major consumer ecosystems, a lot of them are still using 5.1.2 you know, or 712 uh, re-render environments. And so especially if in like a 512 re-render environment, it's really critical that those um, values get maintained. So, so I think that's a huge and critically important part of anticipating success under those limited output opportunities. And that works for whether it's happening at the consumer level to the MP4 or, the, or whatever encode you're using, or if you're delivering channel-based renders uh, high res. So. So yeah, but I mean, definitely as always experiment with that on your own, you can monitor that behavior in real time with the renderer. If you just, if you're in nine one or whatever and you pop it down to five two, you, you can always hear that based on those trim and down mix settings. So experiment with it for yourself, but I strongly encourage uh, that that you try to do that. Uh, that is a limitation logic doesn't let you do that, but anything that uses the renderer and another DAW does let you do that. So that's really great. And you can also change that after the fact if you are producing in logic. So just because that Apple doesn't let you do it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you have to take an extra step. Cool, thanks. All right, we've got time for a couple of more. Nick, I'm gonna hit you with them while we've got you some creative uh, questions and some routing questions. Right. So let's let's fire through a couple of them here real quick. Could you quickly explain your routing setup of your object bed? This is uh, from Mark, maybe just a quick overview of, of how you, you route. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, before Pro Tools 2023.6, I would, um, you know, create a 712 mix bus with a lot of customized sub paths and then a couple of additional paths. Um, I also created, so I often operate in 0.6 rooms. And so I used a 71 bus to um, 
or 7o bus to allow me to have a multi-channel access to all six of those speakers and then that feeds into an object bed so it's like 15 objects that represent basically a 916 output uh, that I could route within with a little bit of this and that. Um, now that with 2023.6, I have 916 mixed bus opportunities, I can get a one-to-one -one, uh, access to my object bed, which occupies the first 15, you know, so objects 11 through 25 um, are all, you know, routed to those locations. Um, and I can get a one-to-one -one access to that with the 916 uh, mix bus or 906 mix bus. And then I always bus discreetly to my LFE. I have an intermediate uh, aux path with a filter in it. So it's, you know, it's a fab filter pro Q3 with a low pass at like, I don't know, it's like at 120 with uh, 24 dB per octave slope or something like that uh, in linear phase. So it nice and lines up everything, you know, everything's hitting at the same time. Um, just because the RMU prints the LFE full range and I just, I don't, I, I prefer to take that control into myself. So, so I always do discrete routing through a send to the LFE and then uh, my object bed as I described. And then of course, everything else uh, just, you know, generally bust to its own discrete object, uh, which will have a dedicated uh, binaural render setting. Great, thanks. Okay, one more for you on plugins. Our buddy Sam Downey asks, um, what plugins do you use? Or do you have any go-tos? Plugins, just like that are specific to the immersive space perhaps? Because um, otherwise, you know, when you're mixing from post-mix stems, you know, the, the advantage to that of course is that you're maintaining, um, you know, the intention of the artist in the original mixer, right? It's not it's not for me to then decide to then like re-EQ or re-dynamic something i mean you might do a little bit of work to try and match what happened in stereo mastering or you might do something that happens when you pull two things apart and they're no longer competing with each other so then you can do different things um so under those circumstances i like to use things that are very capable but tonally transparent so again i'm a big fab filter fan for that um so it's kind of like i wasn't there but i had to make some adjustments to sort of make it you know do the best that it can uh, in the space, you know, optimize it for the space. Um, if I'm doing like legacy stuff, um, I'm a big UAD fan. So I will, you know, you get multi-tracks or raw tape. I try to do my homework, you know, so I've, I've done a lot of work on like the Bob Marley catalog and I, I've, I've said this in some of our other forums, but, you know, I try to figure out what studios they were at, what consoles they had, what, you know, types of reverbs they had, and then try to use those to when I'm recreating the mix so that it's as accurate historically as possible and has those tones and textures. Especially when you find out they were on like an API, which is fixed frequency. So it's like there's literally the right combination of things that'll make it sound exactly the same. That's always really nice. Um, so so I'll try to do my homework and then use the right gear. And then when we get into like immersive specific stuff, huge fan of what Liquid Sonics is doing. Uh, the cinematic rooms, the lustrous plates, um, Seventh Heaven, they're all just, I mean, they sound incredible. They can go from any channel format to any other channel format all the way up to 916, which I think is just fantastic. Um, you know, it's really nice and really, you know, high res and creative and cool. Um, you know, I, I try to stay away from things like up mixing, uh, you know, but there are some good opportunities to use some of those tools uh, as a component in your mix, but obviously never like a two to seven situation, um, you know, but the halo is pretty good for that. Um, you know, I like the Dolby Panner. I use the Dolby Panner plugin for automation based stuff, you know, tempo synced revolutions, whether they be circular or square. It's great for that, um, you know, and then there's just a lot of other great, you know, uh, opportunities to create custom things. I like, I have a mono in 10 channel return Lexicon 480 reverb matrix that I made because I like that plugin and I think it's really useful and tonally transparent. And it's also, I'm not limited to immersive space simply because the plugin design doesn't accommodate a multi-channel output. So, um, you know, getting creative with the IO page and the bus routing and things like that, that can really help, you know, create meaningful uh, opportunities to expand beyond what might be a limitation of a plugin design. Boom. Well, there you go, Sam. Hope that answers your question. And uh, thank you, Nick, for being a wealth of talent, knowledge, and wisdom. Appreciate everything there. Thank you, Jordan, for everything that you've done to uh, share with the community here and continue to develop the tools. And a huge shout out to Dave Emery for all the work that he's done and uh, his team for spending time to uh, get this out there to the world as well. And with that, we're going to close the session. Thank you all for being here and have a great day.